It's one of the most famous tales of the Old Testament. The Fall of Jericho. It is the story of the incredible first battle fought by Joshua and the Israelites. They're taking no prisoners, they clear the land by exterminating the army and then turning on the civilian population and exterminating it. The fall of Jericho is the moment when the Israelites first conquer God's promised land. But for many, this story is simply too extraordinary. It may even be a complete fiction. Jericho really begins to put doubt in people's minds as to whether this biblical narrative hangs together historically as it is told. And yet for others, the Bible's version of events is based on a kernel of truth. Stories in the Bible don't come from nowhere. They're picking up real folk traditions, weaving them together into a story in the dim and distant past. And for one man, the archaeological evidence matches the biblical account word for word. To my mind, it certainly shows not only accuracy, but even an eyewitness account. For archaeologist Bryant Wood, scattered among the ancient ruins of Jericho, is evidence that backs up one of the most incredible stories in the Bible, the fall of Jericho. As a boy, growing up in Endicott, New York, Bryant Wood has little interest in the Bible or archaeology. Instead, he focuses on a promising academic and athletic career. He sets school records in cross-country and track and gains an athletic scholarship to Syracuse University. Eventually, he graduates with a degree in mechanical engineering. I was more interested, I guess, in technical things. I think at that point in my life, I didn't even realize there was such a thing as archaeology that a person could do for a career, you know. In 1958, Wood joins the General Electric Company in upstate New York. While at GE, he works as a nuclear engineer, designing fabricating and testing nuclear reactors. But soon after, Wood's life changes forever. My mother-in-law gave me a present right after I was married, and it was a book dealing with archaeology and the Bible. The book triggers a deep fascination in the nuclear scientist. All these things that are there in the Bible, which I knew nothing about, uh, suddenly became very fascinating to me. Wood's growing interest in archaeology doesn't go unnoticed by his wife. I got to the point where I thought, you know, money isn't everything. Let him maybe, you know, if he wants to do something, let him do it. And one day my wife said, well, have you ever thought about going back to school and studying archaeology? I thought, wow, that would be something. In 1973, after 13 years, Wood leaves his well-paid job. He goes back to college to pursue archaeology and Bible studies. I had an early midlife crisis. I was, what, 36, I guess, when I left GE. At the time, I had four children and had to, uh, you know, kind of uh, provide for them. But I was able to do part-time work, and my wife went back to work. It 
was a tremendous change. I brought up the four kids by myself. He was basically gone for 12 years. So he missed all the graduations, he missed everything. Sometimes I'd feel bad about it, but it's what he had to do. Wood soon becomes an expert in Canaanite pottery. The pottery of the ancient land of Canaan. Pottery is a very important thing in archaeology, particularly when you're working in the area of ancient Palestine, because we have few written documents that are found there. So we depend upon pottery to provide our dating for the material that we're excavating. Wood's expertise takes him to the heart of one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Joshua's attack on Canaan and the fall of Jericho. The story of Jericho comes at the end of what people generally think of as the Exodus. The Israelites leave Egypt and, as is famous, spend 40 years wandering in the desert, then go across the Jordan and, as their first act, siege the city of Jericho. The only written record of the Battle of Jericho is in the book of Joshua. As the successor to Moses, it's Joshua's mission to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land. It is Joshua's responsibility to fight the battles necessary to take possession of this land that the text says has been promised to them by their God, Yahweh. His first campaign is to conquer the Canaanite stronghold of Jericho. Wood soon discovers that the story has all the elements of a Hollywood movie. Two Israelite spies whose mission is to infiltrate the enemy city. Rahab, the prostitute with a heart of gold, who helps Joshua's secret agents sneak into Jericho. To get into Canaan, Joshua has to cross the mighty river Jordan. A miracle parts the waters. Joshua then lays siege to the fortified city. On the seventh day, the sound of trumpets and a chorus of shouting bring its walls tumbling down. The Israelites storm the city slaughter its people and burn Jericho to the ground. It's an incredible story, but is there any truth to it? The ancient city of Jericho is one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world. It lies 22 kilometers east of Jerusalem and 10 kilometers west of the Jordan River. A large gushing spring and the fertile plain around it earned it the nickname the City of Palm Trees. But today, it's known as Tel el Sultan. Jericho has been excavated by a number of different archaeological teams. And we have evidence not just for one Jericho, but actually for multiple Jerichos, so one city built on top of another. Now, that's where the debate and the problem comes in because the simple question is, which of the many Jerichos that exist is the one that Joshua might have captured? The Bible's own chronology says when Jericho fell. In 1406 BC. So if the story is true, there should be evidence of destruction 
from the 1400s, the Late Bronze Age. In the 1930s, British archaeologist John Garstang finds a network of collapsed walls. They seem to have fallen in a dramatic fashion. Garstang analyzes the Canaanite pottery. It's from the period experts call the Late Bronze Age. Garstang, who said that you know he had late bronze material and the destruction happened around 1400 BC, which happens to be the biblical dating of the uh, account in the book of Joshua about the destruction of uh, Jericho. That means the walls were destroyed around 1400 BC. That's exactly the time frame of the Battle of Jericho in the Bible. Garstang's evidence supports the Bible story. But 20 years pass and everything changes. The Jewish state of Israel is founded, inspiring fresh archaeological digs. In the 1950s, a new excavation begins at Tel Sultan. The lead archaeologist is Kathleen Kenyon, a colleague of Garstang's. Everyone expects her to confirm his results. Instead, she flatly contradicts Garstang. Kenyon, and she came along in the 1950s, she says, well, no, no, uh, Garstang's wrong. There was nobody living there at that time. She dates the Canaanite pottery to the Middle Bronze Age, 1550 BC, 150 years earlier. Joshua wasn't even born then. It means Garstang was wrong. It means the Bible is wrong. So if you go with Kenyon's dating, then that city that's destroyed at Jericho cannot have been destroyed by Joshua. Jericho is empty at that time. There is no city for Joshua to capture, meaning the story didn't happen. For more than 3,000 years, the Bible's story of the fall of Jericho was accepted as history. Now, in the space of a few years, it becomes a fiction. In the early days, the majority view was that that was a historical battle and that has changed over time into where today the majority view would be that it's legendary. And Wood discovers that the damage to the Bible is even worse. There's no possibility that the Bible got its chronology wrong by 150 years. As a result, scholars are questioning the whole of Joshua's conquest. The book of Joshua talks about a blitzkrieg war. The Israelites came in and they conquered Jericho, Jerusalem, Megiddo, and Hazor, all of those. If the battle at Jericho did not take place the way that the Bible says it did, then why should we believe the account for the capture of any of the other cities? Kenyon's discoveries at Jericho have called the whole biblical account into question. Nineteen eighty-three, Toronto University. Bryant Wood, at last completes his PhD thesis. He's only too aware that most scholars no longer believe the Bible's story of the fall of Jericho. But Wood is now himself an expert. In the Canaanite pottery 
of the Late Bronze Age, the very period when the Bible says Jericho was conquered. The subject of my thesis was Late Bronze Age pottery. In the course of my studies, I was collecting uh, the Late Bronze Age pottery that had been excavated by various uh, expeditions. And I came across the site of Jericho. Wood decides to re-examine the pottery reports of Jericho. He wants to check if Garstang and Kenyon dated the pottery shards correctly. But the pottery proves difficult to locate. So I realized that a lot of his pottery remained unpublished and that he had given it to various institutions that had supported his excavation. Unlike other archaeologists, Wood decides to track down every pottery shard. It's the start of an incredible journey of discovery. So I traveled all over England, Scotland, Wales, some instances, other countries such as going to the Rockefeller Museum in Israel. When I went to the Louvre, they pulled out boxes, I swear, that had not been looked in since Garstang sent it there. Wood meticulously documents each piece. Archaeology is not only work out in the field excavating a site, Sometimes you have to excavate a museum basement. I'd meet him someplace in France or England or someplace, and we'd have a nice vacation. Really, he wanted to go to the libraries and things like that. So. I guess that's just my nature, that I'll go to great lengths to be thorough in my research and my analysis. Even though it was a costly uh, adventure, but it was well worth it. After months of checking, Wood makes a startling discovery. Kenyon had been selective in her examination of pottery. She never analyzed her uh, local Canaanite pottery that she found in that destruction debris. She was basing it solely on the absence of imported pottery. That makes Wood doubt the reliability of Kenyon's dating of Jericho. He then checks Garstang's pottery. To his amazement, his original assessment was spot on. When I looked at the Jericho material, I uh, saw a pottery that was very definitely late Bronze Age. And when I looked at it, I could see, wow, this is uh, late Bronze One. Pottery doesn't lie. In Wood's expert opinion, the shards of Canaanite pottery are clear. They put the destruction of Jericho at precisely 1400 BC, the time of Joshua. Kenyon said there was no city or town or habitation during this time period, it's the 15th century BC. She said it was abandoned. Well, this is strange. Here's pottery that's clearly uh, 15th century in date. It all means that the fall of Jericho did happen at the time of Joshua, just as the Bible claims. But did it happen exactly as the Bible says it did? What about Joshua's miraculous crossing into the Promised Land? The story of Rahab and the spies, the trumpets, and the tumbling walls of Jericho.
the land of Canaan. 1406 BC. Two Israelite spies are on a mission to evaluate the terrain and to assess the defenses of Jericho. That's how the story of the fall of Jericho begins. Wood knows archaeology can't prove Joshua sends spies into Jericho. But the strategy seems correct on military grounds. Joshua is not only a great military strategist and tactician, he's probably one of the greatest generals of antiquity. His first tactical requirement uh, is, of course, to gather as much information as he can about the enemy. If the account of Joshua is a fraud, then it was written by someone who really understood the nature of combat. Once inside Jericho's city walls, the spies make their way to a brothel and meet Rahab, the prostitute. When the king of Jericho discovers that spies have entered his city, she hides them under sheaths of flax, drying on the roof. Biblical archaeologists would regard the truth of the Rahab episode as futile speculation. But Wood finds that experts on military strategy have no such qualms. Well, like all good agents, they are looking for a place to gather information. Where would you go uh, inside any city, even today, where strangers would not be recognized, where there's a lot of loose talk, and where all kinds of people at all kinds of social levels interact? The answer is a whorehouse. So the spies uh, sneak out of Jericho. They complete their mission go by going back to Joshua. Joshua begins to make preparations for invading, but uh, he's got a bit of a problem because they have to cross the River Jordan before they can get to Jericho. The crossing of the Jordan is one of the great miracles of the Bible. It's springtime, when the snow melt swells the rivers. Joshua and his army can't cross into Canaan. And just like at the Red Sea, that God comes through at just the right moment to allow the Israelites to cross, God will again come through at just the right moment for Joshua and the people of Israel at the Jordan River. As a scientist, Wood wonders if there's a natural explanation for the miracle, such as an earthquake. He discovers that the Jordan River lies on the edge of a tectonic plate that runs all the way down to the Rift Valley in Africa. The Middle East is a major fault line, and this is a site uh, of breakage where the crust of the Earth breaks occasionally, and this is manifested in earthquakes. Wood finds records that show in 1927 an earthquake dammed up the River Jordan. For 20 hours, the waters cease to flow. An earthquake can dam a river if a large landslide falls inside it. And we have evidence and written reports about such events in the past. It is very likely that an earthquake facilitated the crossing of the Jordan by the Israelites. A rockfall or a, a landslide made it possible to cross easily. But Wood finds that military experts disagree with the earthquake idea. Such an idea is, is not even really worth considering because it essentially means that the tempo and timing of Joshua's attack depends on the next earthquake. 
It just defies logic that a man who reconnoitre his objective would not reconnoitre the river in order to find out, you know, where the crossing points were. A very simple way of crossing a swift river or stream was, of course, to break the speed of the current. The most common way is to simply put something upstream that takes the force of the current. Horus, when he fought against Alexander, used elephants to do it. And the American wagon trains crossing the American continent did it by putting their wagons or their livestock upstream. Theories about the crossing of the Jordan are speculative. But for Wood, they do show it was possible. Depending on how you view that event, a miracle or a natural catastrophe, whatever, it could certainly happen just as it's described in the Bible. Wood is satisfied that the date and start of the Joshua story is historically possible. The real challenge for Wood is Joshua's attack on Jericho itself. Can his expertise in archaeology prove the details of the story? The siege. The walls tumbling down. And the fall of Jericho itself. The Bible says the siege took place in the spring, just after the harvest. Now, when the spies went in to Jericho and they went to Rahab's house, she hid them under the flax on her roof. Well, the flax was up there because it was drying. And that's another indicator that it was just after the harvest. That's an unusually precise detail for a story set three and a half thousand years ago. Wood wants to see whether archaeology can confirm the season and duration of the siege. He sifts through the excavation reports of Garstang and Kenyon. He's looking for any clues they may have overlooked. He's intrigued by one of their discoveries. They found rooms with large storage jars. The jars were full of grain, untouched for thousands of years. Garstang and Kenyon had paid little attention to the grain. But to Wood, it's evidence that the siege occurred soon after the spring harvest, just as the story says. It's obvious that this grain had just been harvested because the jars were full. They had not used uh, this grain yet. And that again agrees with the Bible. Wood could not only confirm the season, but also the duration of the siege. In theory, Jericho could have held out for months, years even. And we know at Jericho that there is a spring that runs all year round, and if they still had access to that spring, they had then plentiful water. We're also told in the biblical account that the harvest had just taken place. So there should have been a lot of food there. But the Bible is quite specific about the length of the siege. It says it only lasted seven days. That's another very precise detail. And it's also confirmed by the jars of grain. It was not 
consumed, the jars were full. And so the siege of the city was very short. The Bible tells us exactly how long. It was seven days. So the jars of grain correlate very nicely with what we read in the Bible. The pottery confirms the dating of the Bible story. And the grain backs the timing of the attack. But can would explain the collapse of the walls and the destruction of the city. Once they cross the Jordan, there's no turning back. The die is cast. Joshua leads his army towards Jericho. The city closes its gates, and its population is sealed in. Confronting Joshua are the walls of Jericho. Tall, and impregnable, or so they seemed. The Bible says Joshua marched his priests, the Ark of the Covenant, and the whole army once around the city every day for six days. On the seventh, they march around the city seven times, and on the seventh lap, the shouts of the Israelites and sounds of the trumpets create a deafening noise. And the text tells us that it's in that very moment that these massive walls of Jericho come tumbling down, such that the army can go straight up into the city, and they kill every man, woman, beast, and child they can find. It is presented as complete and total annihilation. The tumbling walls of Jericho is the most famous moment in the story. Wood decides it's time to see the evidence for himself. September 1997. It's a two-hour drive from Tel Aviv airport to Jericho. For Wood, it's an opportunity of a lifetime to examine firsthand the results of previous excavations. Everywhere around him, he sees evidence of fallen walls. No one's ever denied that the walls of Jericho collapsed in ancient times. We have to remember that this is not the only time that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. They seem to have done it with some frequency. The real question is whether they collapsed at the time of Joshua's attack. The Bible says yes, it was a miracle. Wood wonders if there might also be a natural explanation. Jericho is very close to the River Jordan fault line. Closer than San Francisco is to the San Andreas Fault. An earthquake is a very distinct possibility. Both the Garstang and Kenyon found evidence of earthquake activity. And so it could have been uh, another earthquake that brought the walls down. But military experts don't believe that an earthquake makes any sense. Would be a dumb commander that would somehow think that it will delay the invasion or the attack on Jericho until the next earthquake. It's silly to attribute something to an event which is more easily explained by other more simple and provable causes. The destruction of the walls of Jericho uh, has nothing to do with an earthquake, it's easily explainable in military terms. 
For Gabriel, the success of Joshua's attack can be explained entirely by his military genius. The Bible says the spies inside Jericho instruct Rahab to tie a red cord to her outside window. Ostensibly, it is to let the invading Israelites know where Rahab is. The entire army is told to leave her and her family be. All the while they go about destroying, as one might say, everything that moves. So in the midst of this battle, this red cord symbolizes the presence of Rahab and her family, who they are meant to spare for her kindness to the spines earlier. But Gabriel doesn't buy the traditional explanation. The crimson cord is hung on the window on the outside of the wall, which means, of course, you could not be seen from inside the wall. Now that raises the question, if it wasn't to warn the Israelites about where Rahab lived, what was the purpose of the crimson cord hanging from her window on the outside of the wall? Gabriel believes the crimson cord was part of a plan to launch a surprise attack. The purpose of that court is to identify the point of access for Israeli small special operation teams over seven days to gradually put men up that rope into that apartment until they have a force inside that can be used for a surprise attack. By the seventh day, 30 to 40 Israelite soldiers could have smuggled their way into the city waiting for the signal to strike. Then one day, the army forms again. And then suddenly, boom, there's a blustering of noise where there had been silence, there's drums, there's the blowing of the shofar. The attack is coming.
all. It was a massive destruction. The devastation is total. Well, almost. The Bible says the Israelites don't actually plunder the grain for their own use. They leave it behind. When you look at the biblical account, we have a chronology there of events. We have the Israelites attacking, we have the wall collapsing, the Israelites go up into the city, they attack the city, they don't plunder it, but they burn it as an offering to the Lord.